I want to talk about five things public health got wrong during this pandemic. As somebody with a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins, as somebody who's immersed in the field of science, I think it's important that we are honest about what we did well and what we did poorly. But first, I must say, I do believe that one of the failures chronically in public health is that it is underfunded. It is underfunded in times of peace so that it is naturally going to be deeply unprepared in times of crisis. We do need some robust method of funding meaningful, useful, quantifiable, reliable public health for decades to come. I think that's one problem. The next thing I want to preface this by saying, why am I not saying the five things politicians got wrong? Well, it's not just five things. It's like 500 things or 5,000 things. I could spend all day talking about what politicians got wrong, but to be honest, I don't expect them to get a lot of things right. I do expect better from the public health and science community, and that's why I'm going to talk about that in this video. So number one, the first thing they got wrong, follow the science, the slogan. Public health and scientists confused science and policy throughout this pandemic. What do I mean by that? Science, of course, <clears throat> is a set of principles. It's a set of understanding how the world works through experimentation, through a set of logical principles. It is a method of knowing. Policy is how you are to act in response to a crisis. And policy is never driven solely by science alone. It always requires the input of values and preferences of the general public. And so I think we saw throughout this pandemic, but particularly early on, the certain types of scientists dominated the conversation about what the policy response ought to have been. And they didn't do a good job, I think, of including scholars of broad disciplines, including history, psychology, including philosophy, including scientists who may even disagree with them about policy impacts. They didn't do a good job of fostering that broad conversation and finally of soliciting the values and preferences and trade-offs the public were willing to accept. We saw throughout this pandemic a running column in the New York Times about what epidemiologists would do would they take mail and open it up right away or they let it sit for three days or all sorts of things like that that is part of the problem here because an epidemiologist should be able to tell you the magnitude of the risk and how that risk compares to other risks you accept in your life but it really is a personal choice no one has the monopoly on whether or not you ought to do any of these specific things in many of these surveys and i think that was one of the failures was that we we're too strict about epistemic trespassing. Number two, they didn't admit uncertainty. Actually, this should be like multiple asterisks. Over and over throughout this pandemic, and even to this moment, many scientists who do know better refuse to admit uncertainty. Um, recently, I wrote an article, I'm going to put the link down below, in the Atlantic Magazine. And that article about was about the evidence for masking school-aged children. And one of the things that went into the article was just the realization that a lot of other countries across the pond aren't doing this. They never did it. They never masked a child under the age of 12 in the United Kingdom. They were very reluctant to do it in countries like Sweden and Norway, and they have different age cutoffs. The WHO says don't mask a child younger than six. The WHO says only mask selectively under 12. That's in contradiction with the U.S. policy and the AAP and the CDC of masking over two. If people were honest, we would admit, as my Atlantic article argues, that there is in fact no credible evidence in this space. And that honesty might help shape the debates. It might kind of take some of the steam out of the room on both sides. It might be refreshing for people who are critical of this to hear, you know, on balance, we think it's a good idea, but we don't really know for sure. And it might be sobering and, and have an ounce of humility to admit that you actually haven't done really good studies to clarify if this works in this age group. And just because it works in adults doesn't mean it naturally work in children. That would be a ludicrous argument. If that were the case, then you wouldn't even need to do different vaccine trials, would you? Everything works perfectly in children. Of course, that's not the case. Children are not just little adults. Number three, they didn't reduce uncertainty. If you don't admit uncertainty, you won't reduce uncertainty. If you're so confident your interventions work, you won't embark on a research agenda that actually tries to provide extra information. And I think to me, two and three are the things I've been talking about my whole career. Classic failures of scientists in all sorts of disciplines that lead to medical reversals, that lead to all sorts of problems. It's that we don't admit that we don't know for sure and we don't run a robust clinical trials agenda. And so here, all these months, these last few months, we could have been doing cluster randomized trials. We've done zero in this country on masking young children, even though it's one of the most polarized and divisive issues. We could have been doing it for so many things. It could have been a multi-arm study with face shields, with the availability of hand sanitizer, with distancing, with masking, with masking in certain parts and certain activities and not other places and different strategies for lunch. This could have all been tested in randomized fashion. The financial and human implications of this are so vast, it is... Ludicrous that we didn't do a robust clinical trials agenda here. 
<clears throat> Margaret McCartney from the UK, she was very good about calling for this early on, but we failed to heed those calls in part because it is so much more seductive to claim you know the answer. And I think that was, when this is these two and three points, they're related, don't admit uncertainty and don't reduce it. That's a great failure of the pandemic. Number three, or right, number four, shame, blame, demonization. This has gone on. It's fundamentally antithetical to principles of public health. You don't get far by shaming and blaming people. You get far by trying to serve the people. And we saw from early pandemic, from you know the pictures on the beach to the constant um, tweets by public health experts or people who at least claim to be, um, that are nothing more than shaming and blaming others and always trying to blame this pandemic on some people, not us, but those people. That's a very dangerous way to think about your fellow human beings. It's a very dangerous way to communicate, and it's ultimately self-defeating. It creates tribal divisions that cannot be healed, at least in the short term when you need people to cooperate. We see it now with demonization. <clears throat> I've read so many pieces about, you know, should unvaccinated people have access to care? Uh, have you lost your sense? Uh, have you lost your purpose? Have you lost your principles? Of course, it doesn't matter what anyone does in this world. From anything you can imagine, when somebody seeks medical care, they ought to get medical care. That is a universal principle of health care. We do not discriminate on what the basis of someone did and what you think about it. And if you're perfectly honest, if you do acknowledge that this is some worldview that has led someone to this path, surely as a compassionate person, you should forgive that that worldview is a product of external circumstances that are not in that person's control. And so I find the shame, the blame, the demonization, these kinds of things has been really terrible. And it even works for scientists you disagree with. That, that's also part of the shame and blame mentality. And that's been a great failure of the public health. Um, number five, tribalism. Um, it's easy to think that the other side polarized the issue, but you leaned into it too. You leaned into it on a number of fronts, on the masking front, on the hydroxychloroquine front. You know, when they said you ought to do it right away, you leaned into that it's a very toxic product. Well, you shouldn't do it right away. No, it should be tested in a randomized study, but you shouldn't go around telling people it's very, very toxic because you'll have difficulty accruing your randomized control trial. We need to shoot for the middle, which is, hey, Let's keep an open mind. Let's run the controlled trials. And while we do so, let's not call things horse dewormer or other pejorative things if they're for ongoing randomized controlled trials. Let's try to have some nuance here. So tribalism, it's something that not just they do, it's something that public health and scientists did too. <clears throat> you put these together, these five things, and I think it is a sobering reflection of the failures of, of the side of the scientists. And I could list, you know, thousands of things politicians got wrong, but I don't expect them to get things right. I do expect scientists to get a better job of at least acknowledging uncertainty, reducing uncertainty, communicating accurately, and not constantly seeking to engage in ad hominem vitriol. Um, but I've been deeply disappointed. And I think that this damage um, is really deep. I mean, this damage extends to lots of other things like the evidence for boosters, at least now we have a Pfizer press release about a randomized trial, but we need to see those data. It extends to when are we going to remove some of these mandates and they're not clear guidance about the stopping rules. And I'll tell you something, if you don't have a clear and defensible stopping rule and you get past the stopping rule and then you stop it and you could have stopped it three months ago, the public is naturally going to have a lot of, a lot of anger. So what am I to think of this whole space? I guess I would say that like many, I myself am also disappointed. I think science is the greatest tool we have, and it is the only way that we could have approached the pandemic, and we ought to have approached this pandemic. I think what scientists ought to have done is really try to do a better job of making transparent the trade-offs, quantifying the trade-offs, making sense of the trade-offs, but then really doing a better job of bringing in a broad group of people with diverse ideas and perspectives to see what they value as we crafted policy. Instead, what we got was an entirely piecemeal policy that uh, I think was irrational, that was capricious, that varied from state to state, that varied in so many ways, um, resulting in, I think, uh, incoherence across the whole space. And if the net result is the whole thing is incoherent, that's not good for anybody. So these are my thoughts. Uh, five reasons why science failed. And the last thing I'll say is, I started this out with the defense of you need to fund this more. <clears throat> you do need to fund it more. 
You need to fund it more for many reasons, but one is that adequate and sustained and growing funding will actually kind of draw in the best minds into the space in the decades to come. You want to fund it more going forward. You want to fund it in a broad way so that you draw in more voices and more stakeholders with different perspectives who are able to see trade-offs differently. I think of all the things we did, large and small, the United States will someday be known for the greatest failure, which was school closure. I think I'm already seeing some public opinion data showing that people are going to punish, I think, anyone they feel uh, stood in the path of school reopenings. I think that's the way the public's going to vote. And I think as the years accumulate, school closures will be seen as the greatest policy error. You need to create a public health department, an infrastructure so robust that that could never happen again, that you would have somebody there capable of articulating those trade-offs early on, a large vocal contingent to prevent, I think, fear and um, the need uh, for a dramatic response from triumphing over, I think, a sober assessment of risks and benefits. And so I do think going forward, defunding is not the solution. Funding is actually the solution in trying to build a broad and diverse group of stakeholders who are committed, I think, to soliciting the public input and also seeking other external experts with domain expertise besides theirs. So those are my thoughts. This is what you get on this channel. If you like it, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Until next time.